All right, good afternoon, everyone. So we head into the two o'clock hour. Just want to say hello. My name is Rachel Clifton. I am the Assistant Director of the Wyoming Arts Council. I use she, her pronouns. And for those of you who are not able to join us with a visual, um, a description for you, I'm coming to you from Laramie, my house in Laramie. I'm in my dining room with my kitchen and super messy fridge behind me. Um, I am a white woman in my mid thirties and I have chin length blonde hair. So thank you all for joining us for our next session. Um, there is uh, just a couple of housekeeping things. If you would like to keep yourself muted so we don't get any feedback unless you have a question um, for this next session, we are inviting questions throughout. So feel free to unmute yourself. If you would like to add a comment, ask a question, you can also use the reactions button. Um, so you can raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question. Um, and also we'll be utilizing the chat feature in this session. So feel free to drop questions into there and I'll be keeping an eye on that um, so that we can chat with our next presenter. Um, as we head into this second hour, we do want you to do what you need to do to be comfortable and stay engaged and focused. So if you need to get up, walk around, take a break, get some coffee, get some water, um, whatever you need to do, please do feel free. Um, also, if you need live transcription or um, subtitles, there's a CC live transcript button at the bottom of your screen that you can turn on. Um, a couple other things to note for this session, there is a hands-on component. So I know some of us are all set up to do some paper marbling with Renee. Um, if you did not sign up, that's okay. Um, if you're not, if you got your kit and you're not ready to participate, that's okay too. Um, Renee's going to be sharing lots of good information about building community and collaboration. So we'll be talking with her. And as I mentioned before, feel free to ask questions throughout. So um, if you're not doing the, the hands-on portion, that's totally okay. We hope you'll stick around with us for this next hour. So with that, I'm going to kick it over to Renee Williams, who's the founder of Science Loves Art, which is also here in a, another kind of gloomy day here in Laramie. Hello, how are you? Um, I am Renee Williams, and I'm in Laramie, Wyoming, as Rachel mentioned. Um, I hope that you guys will stick around, even if you didn't get the kit or order the mini marbling kit. Um, I do, before we get started, um, I have a little video that explains a little bit about me and my background in Science Loves Art, um, and also dem uh, demonstrates this technique, mini marble or marbling, sumenagashi marbling. Um, I would love to know um, what your interests are. So while we watch the video, if some of you are interested in marbling for your own artistic um, technique, or knowledge, or if you um, would like to use the artwork as an extension or a collaboration effort, um, or if you just have other ideas about marbling, I would like to know that because after the demonstration and the little video, um, I really want our focus of this discussion to be about what you're most interested in and how I can facilitate why you're here today and what you're most interested in. So. Um, Science Loves Art, um, we've, we've tried to grow throughout the state and create these collaborations. So hopefully we can um, create some more collaborations today. So I'm gonna share my screen now and I'm gonna show you just a little bit of a video um, and kind of do a demonstration about with, with the mini marbling. If you want to do the mini marbling along with me, that's great. And if you would rather just watch the video and do the marbling later, that's great too. I'll, I think we're gonna have time at the end that if you have questions, I can do some more live demonstrations for you and answer any questions you have. You can share your screen um, and it'll just be a fun, fun time for us to share our artwork. Um, so does anyone have any questions before we get started? Okay, I'm gonna share my screen and I will see you guys here in a little bit. Um, 
audio advice. Oh, shoot. Sorry, everybody. Always happens. Here we go. Hey, I am Renee Williams. Um, can you see my screen? I'm coming to you from my studio. Yes, we can. Laramie. Yes. We're on the very outskirts of downtown. Um, and this building was the original Laramie floral. So we have a greenhouse in the back and I have a few images I can show you at the end. But if you're ever in Laramie, I would love to show you around. So today I thought I would tell you just a little bit about who I am and my background. Um, if you have any questions later, I'm happy to fill in more. But just briefly, um, I was a CPA, Certified Public Accountant. And that I had my own small business consulting business in Tucson, Arizona, where I lived with my husband, who is a botanist and professor. And we had three boys and we were just living the rat race life. And one day my husband said, we should move to France. Let's just sell everything and simplify our lives. We don't need all this. And let's just simplify and let's just see what happens. So we did. We sold our house. I sold my business and we sold a lot of our furniture and things we didn't need and we moved to france for nine for nine ten months and that was the first time in my life i hadn't worked full time and i was able to start to enjoy architecture and cooking more gardening and of course expanding into art the things i had always loved i just thought it was a hobby um so that was great for our kids um, to experience in our family and it pretty much changed our lives. So we decided after that experience, we would move to Laramie because of the lifestyle here. It's actually very similar to our lifestyle in France. We uh, rode our bikes everywhere and we just had a small community. We lived in a little uh, village on the outskirts of Toulouse. I just wanna wrap up a little bit more about me. Uh, after we moved to Laramie, Wyoming, I went and back to the University of Wyoming and got my Bachelor's of Fine Arts, which is great. The faculty there are amazing. I learned so much and my focus was sculpture, um, which gave me the opportunity to learn new techniques with hands-on that I love and continue to work with my concrete there and also metalsmithing, which I've always loved making jewelry and uh, art history has inspired a lot of my artwork and also science and plants. So it's been a great experience. Um, I'm all into science loves art right now and maintaining and pushing forward with this passion. So for now, I try to do a little bit of my own art, but mainly I focus on Science Loves Art. The idea of Science Loves Art with some science scientist friends, we did an exhibit um, that bring a, brought about awareness about the fossils that we have in Wyoming. But uh, it was interesting that that came about, Science Loves Art came about as a way to use art as a way for scientists to bring the community into their science project rather than just science papers and posters like they're traditionally always done. So um, I started working with scientists to create, create ways for them to exhibit their work in an artistic way. So that has been really fun. And that's something that I do through my own Renee Williams art, but it kind of evolved through Science of Art. And uh, I applied for an EPSCOR National Science Foundation grant as an artist for the outreach part of this five-year project that is about microbes throughout Wyoming in the soil, air, water, which has been really great. And it's inspired me in my artwork and also my life. I create uh, water kefir drinks now and I ferment everything all the time. I'm using fermentation techniques in my garden. Um, mm. But it's really interesting that Wyoming has such a diverse set of microbes, which is a very new part of science because we can use DNA techniques to see the traits and the DNA components of these microbes that before we never knew why these things worked, we just knew they did. So it's been a fun time for me. I'm learning a lot about science, but it's... Oh no. And this Suminakashi marbling attracted me because of these circular forms that are created. Um, so that just became our first kit. So I designed this kit. I learned more about Suminagashi marbling and the history behind it. It was started in Japan in 
the eighth century. Um, so the, but we do get our inks from Japan. I've tried to develop my own. I'm very close to creating some of my own ink. The thing about Suminagashi is, and any marbling really, you want a very strong pigment. It's not really a paint, it's a pigment. And with that pigment, it needs to be light enough that you can, it will sit on top of the water and not sink. So it, sometimes you get the right consistency, but then when you print, it's so light, you can't see it. So with Suminagashi marbling, I just continue to use the inks from Japan for our kits for now. And we have a really great uh, collaborator that provides the inks to us. Um, and she's given us some good pricing so that we don't have to pay for the shipping and all of that. So it's good for us and good for them. And uh, it makes fun. The kits basically that we've created, we try to make them simple. We want them to be accessible so that we can mail them easily to schools, community groups, or individuals and families. We want them to be all inclusive. So a kit will include all of the materials they use. So for the mini marbling, they have a little box that we just put a label on when we ship. You guys have already seen that, has the instructions, has QR code they can get to our website. We're hoping that a lot of the schools and students can watch the website because then they can go from one thing to the next and learn different things and it might be fun for them. So we're creating more videos using more kids to demonstrate um, and we're getting help editing the videos and you know getting those posted to social media. But we do have written instructions which everybody is kind of used to so that's nice. Not everyone has access to a computer or YouTube. So for the mini marbling these came in come in little to go bowls. We'd rather use paper, but we discovered with the paper that they could only use it one or two times and the cup starts falling apart. So with these, they can use them over and over and over again, which is the goal to get these supplies that are reusable and refillable. So as you know, you get the little cup. We have one of our little coasters. All the little mini kits get two colors of paint. They're kind of a little bit random. That's okay. Um, the paper that's very small, but they can make 16 pieces of artwork out of this. So that's still fun. Examples of four cards, but we encourage them to use recycled materials. All right, so you're gonna fill your container about half full and it doesn't matter if your water's hot or cold and you'll have the lid, that's gonna be your palette. And you need to have newspaper or something out to put your work on. It's not too messy, but it's nice to have that. So just whatever paint you have, you're going to have a little bit different bottle than me. These are my studio paints, but you're just going to put two or three drops down. The little paint containers that I gave that you have in your kit, they go a long way, way more than your 16 that are pieces of paper that are included. But it's fun to experiment with different types of paper. Um, and I can talk to you about that a little bit later, about other options, but even copy paper works. So you're gonna use one color of paint for each brush, okay? And you're gonna hold your brush straight up and down like this. Not like this, you're gonna hold it like this. So, okay, I am, you will see that the water will expand when it touches the surface. So by alternating, this is the traditional suminigashi technique, alternate your colors back and forth. And then, you know, you could do thousands of circles. And if you had a bigger container, you could really make some large art or pieces. But these are perfect. This is perfect for enjoying art. It's, you can make some amazing artwork with these. All right. You can let the paint sit for a while. You can tap the table, you can blow on it. It's really fun. Even my voice as I speak will change the artwork. So I kind of like simple. So I am going to leave mine like that. So the paper that are, is in your kit, you're gonna need to cut that ahead of time to a smaller single piece of paper. 
we just folded it for convenience for us and so that it would stay organized for you. So you don't really want air bubbles. So I like to just say, just get a little fold, count to three, one, two, three, and then just gently push your paper down. It'll immediately print onto your paper. So dabbing like this, you're actually rinsing your paper just a little bit. Sometimes the black or the dark colors will almost smear. All right, so now I've got very little paint left on my water and the paper has absorbed the design. So that is the fun part about Sumunagashi is you don't have to do any water prep. You don't have to do any paper prep. You don't have to do any paint prep uh, or paper because it's already ready for you. So we kind of researched that before when we were, um, I did a lot of experimenting with different products. So, so now this is fluid dynamics. You're going to have some residue on the top of the water, which will keep your paints from expanding. Every time you print on this water, it might not move out as much because you've got litter on the top of the water. I kind of like these little background designs that show up. But another thing you could do if you wanted to between designs, you could just kind of stir your water that removes the paint from the top of the water. So I'm going to just do another little design technique for you guys. So it's not, it's important to hold your paintbrush up if that's, if you want to make a circle, it's hard to make a circle when your brush is laying flat. So you'll see my water is moving right now. I could blow. And it really changes the design. You can create more artwork over here. It'll move. When you're happy with how it looks, you can print. Oh, I just messed up. No, I'm going to print it. I just moved it. Sometimes when uh, someone is at the table, you have five people, six people doing this at once, somebody will bump the table. So we just say that's not really a mistake. It's just creating the art. So look, it still worked great. It's still beautiful. Nice piece. Doesn't take long for the pieces to dry. Um, and then you can cut them and make them into cards. And I have a little video about that. So that's the basics about the Sumenigashi. Uh, I'll show you one more little technique. Sometimes I just like to, and kids like to do this too, and adults. They kind of just want to paint a little bit on top. And it's really fun to pull your paintbrush just a little bit through the water and you get these little subtle designs on top. One, two, three. Now this one is very simple, but it will make a beautiful card. You know, sometimes the simpler designs are the best. And don't be worried about uh, dipping your design in the water because it's already printed. Once it's wet, that's the design. You can't really mess it up. It's not like water color paper that keeps absorbing. It's absorbed. So um, I did, I have done this on water color paper and we can talk about that a little bit, but it makes some really pretty um, and interesting designs. All right, I have new water and I also have a little bit of soap. I have one drop of soap in this little container. Um, so I want to show you, let me just show you what, let's see what happens. It's always different. Let's use blue. I'll wash this brush off. Blue. Gray. Did you see that? No, this has a little bit of black in it, but not much. Yeah, I don't know if you saw, but it pushed out. The soap actually saved the spot. 
and pushed out. Let's keep going. And traditional sumanagashi actually uses maybe just black because they didn't have all of the colors that we have now. Our inks come from Japan and they use, traditionally they used resin, pine resin, and trees to give it a lightness, which is a cool science. There's always science behind how all this works. Okay, let's see how this printed. One, two, three. Now remember, you can rinse it a little. Oh, that turned out great. You guys will be amazed at how beautiful these designs are. You don't have to really have any intention at all, which is kind of a relief. It's nice to know that you can just create something without having to think too hard about it. And if the water is moving, you can use different techniques for moving the water intentionally. So you can actually kind of paint on top. You don't want to get soap mixed in with your colors, but because I'm almost done, um, that's when you can kind of have fun with mixing your colors a little bit. Okay, let's see what we can, what we can print with this little design. One, two, three. This is just some from our book binding kit, some of the cards you can make. Um, and that's my studio. And I just wanted to show that's the greenhouse that we have that was we've redone. All right. Okay, are we back? We're back and a couple of questions have come in through the chat. Um, right. Reiterate what types of inks and paints these are. These are Suminagashi marbling inks. They're specific for this technique. So they're not, it's not acrylic paint. There's another marbling technique that is Turkish and they use acrylic paints and you prepare the paper, you prepare the inks, I mean the paint separately but these are Japanese Suminagashi inks. They're made in Japan. I don't know the recipe exactly. I'm working on it, um, but they use pine resin, which lightens the ink, the pigment actually, the ink, and it keeps it floating on top of the water. So we get all of our inks from Japan. We get a direct distributor. They help us a lot because they don't charge us shipping, which can be super expensive. Um, and they give us a little bit of a wholesale price. So that helps us with our cause, you know, with making this affordable. So, but they're real Suminagashi inks and I'm trying to figure out my own way to do it, but I haven't so far. <laughs> it's a secret, I guess. And then I had a question in your demonstration. What type of soap did you use? I used one drop of Dawn with okay. water. Yeah, but you can use any soap and that, that is, I think in the traditional uh, suminagashi, they would put a little bit of pine resin inside water and so that that creates that negative space. And it's really, really fun to create the color and then the negative space. That's, you can just, it's just um, limitless to what you can do because you can make your paints last so much longer. So how many people were trying to create art as I went along? I know that was fast if you're trying to make art right now. Oh, yay. Okay, Rachel did. Well, this is definitely one of those things that you can spend a little bit of time with and experiment with. Um, and I'm happy to do some more with you guys. If some of you want to create art right now, we can definitely do that. We had another question come in. What type of paper? Okay, this is Japanese rice paper. And there's a lot of different types of Japanese rice paper. And I experimented with a lot of different kinds. This one, 
I like it because it's strong enough to uh, pick up the pigments very well, but it doesn't fall apart. It will fall apart if you leave it in the water too long, but um, it's it's strong enough that it it's, gives you this crispy finished product. So it's Japanese rice paper. It's the traditional paper, but it's pretty crispy, easy to work with. I'm gonna look at the chat here too. Do any of you guys, um, I wanted to ask you too, are you wanting to learn how to do this art for your own, not, you know, uh, art kind of like a technique? And I have had a, quite a few artists call and we experiment with different types of paper, different types of, like it'll work great on silk if you're if you're a fabric artist or a textile artist. Um, but it's it's really, really fun to, you know, it, bring into your own art. But I was just wondering how many people are interested in doing something like this with with this, this technique with their own art. And feel free to use the raise hand feature down in the reactions. Um, Desiree, and if you want to see everyone, I should have pointed this out earlier. If you want to see everyone and kind of who's doing what, you can change your view in the top right corner to a gallery view. Um, or if you want to stay focused on Renee and her demonstration, you can keep it on speaker view. So there was a question that came in. Can you please show a few more of the greeting cards you make? Yeah. Yes, I'm glad you asked, brought that up. Um, and I was telling Rachel earlier, so many times, you know, you make something beautiful and you just want to look at it. You know, it's just a beautiful piece of marbling. This is one that I made with all the colors, um, but it is nice to make a book, a handmade book or a card. So I've done several different ones. The ones I've been working on lately, they're smaller. They're just cardstock basically folded. And it's so fun to use recycled materials. Um, when we travel, I love to go to museums or botanical gardens, and it's so fun to use those cards and recycle them and make little gift cards or little notes. But I love just cutting out little small pieces, just simple, very minimalist, and you almost can create a whole nother scene from this little piece rather than what your original part was. So. These are just my favorite are just small little squares glued on. And I like to use stick glue because it's easy and it lasts and it doesn't make a mess. And it gives you a consistent background to your cards. Um, I will put more of these pictures of the cards um, on our social media. And I hope that you guys will share some of your artwork if you're making artwork. Um, I want to make a Facebook page just for us and people that have created these marbling. What were the things that worked for you? What were the things that didn't work for you? And also how would you like to use the art work, you know, in your own um, experience, you know, in your art days, in your community, so. And can you talk, when we, you and I had first talked, you know, you use use this expression of, of the marbling is almost like a gateway into creating other things with it. And yeah. can you talk about how that's been important in developing your kits and sharing those? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the uh, marbling was, you know, inspired by this microbe project I did, the visuals of the microbes and things like that. So, um, but as we got the kits out, so many people were saying, you know, asking what can we do with these now? We have this beautiful artwork. So we created a, for a summer camps, we created a five in one project. We call them camp kits or five in one projects. So we have them now available and we're trying to get those out, but we have five days or five hours. So you could do origami. We've got some, or you could do origami. Bookmaking or card making are super fun. Um, and from that, we were just 
like that, those types of things are what's on our list right now for creating more things for people to make. But traditionally, you, some of you probably know that marbling was used in bookmaking. When they would put the covers of the books, they would use the marbling. I think it was a, a lot of times it was the Turkish marbling, but still the, the books have been traditionally made with marbling. And so it just makes sense and it's fun to continue to create these little books with um, these marbling papers. And I have quite a few examples of those too. We have a whole book binding kit, which basically uses simple materials that you can get around the house. It's just another one of those uh, introduction to what you can do next with these using embroidery thread or thread that you have, using needles that you have there. Um, but we just show different ways that you can use handmade materials and recycled materials with your marbling to make books and cards. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's funny how one thing leads to the next. You know, you're making art or you're creating something and then you realize you can do that for something else. And sometimes like for, for in our situation, um, and I think with most people, your intent is to start out with a plan, but then as time goes on, you realize that there are so many other opportunities that you didn't even think about. You know, people ask, you know, can, can you come see us, but then we can't always be there. So the kits have offered a, given us that opportunity. And I need to become more familiar with using Zoom on a daily basis right now. I don't use Zoom that much, um, but I do use social media, but it's nice to have that two-way road. There needs to be that two-way road that's a personal connection. You know, for, for us, I, I need to see that people are appreciating and valuing what we're doing because many times we turn the road because of them, because they give us an idea. So it has been pretty crazy. And we put them on, uh, we put the kits on online to sell just to see if we could make more money for our mission that way. And it, that's been really interesting because people from all over the country are so excited to have hands-on art that isn't made in China. These kits that aren't made somewhere else, you know, they're happy to have craft that they can share with their family. So I, I just thought our kits would be used for people in schools and isolated areas. And I didn't realize how many isolated people there are, you know? I guess. So would anyone else like another demonstration or do you have any other questions about how this could be used in your, oh, does Denise have a question? Yes, Denise, is that the question you dropped into the chat? Is it, her question is, is it possible to manipulate the ink immediately or soon after it transfers to the paper? Uh, not really. I mean, you, the whatever is on the water, that design, it immediately prints to your paper. And can you manipulate what is on the paper at all or, or not? The at only way you point. can manipulate it is through the water. You have to control your painting through the water. And as you kind of learn how the water moves and did the, it's, so it's a really different, I mean, that's a really good question because we're so used to creating our artwork on paper. In this way, you're gonna create your artwork on the water. So it takes a little bit of practice because it's way, it is, it's moving all the time. It's changing all the time. So it'll print whatever's on your, on your water. It, it immediately like, just transfers over. Mm -hmm. It seems like it's the ultimate watercolor yeah, it is. And it's really fun to, um, once it dries, to see what you can do after that. You can do, you know, you might be able to use other water water painting techniques, you know, as well on that. Um, I did have some an artist that asked, she does a lot of work on water color paper, which I never even tried this technique on watercolor paper. Um, so she sent me 10 different types of paper, different thicknesses, and I was really surprised that it worked. And it was interesting, you know, with watercolor painting, it, the water absorbs slowly as you paint, right? 
it absorbs slowly so you can control the look you can do it a little at a time or with this it's all at one time but it was really interesting to see that as it dried just like with watercolor paintings as it dried it changed a little bit you could see outlines it pulled a little bit it moved where on the rice paper it doesn't change that much when you use the rice paper you print you get that's what you get but with this watercolor paper because it's thicker and it's more observant by nature um, it did change as it dried it moved you know it moved and it pulled and so the colors blended a little bit more and so there's a lot you can do with this this technique and the, these types of paints I, I wish i knew how to make them myself i'm experimenting with pigments but it's a fine line between um, getting a pigment that's bright, has that color and having it float. It's really hard to get a strong pigment that'll float because when you water it down, then you don't have anything left, you know, your pigments watered down, so. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Well, let's see, are there any other questions? Let me show you what the kit includes for those that don't know. I don't think I did that, did I? I did a little bit. But the marbling kit, the video I guess did include that. It has the, the container and the brushes and some stickers. So it's kind of nice because when you're done, our intent was that if we send these to children, they'll have their own set of supplies maybe for the first time ever that they can keep in their room and have their own little set. So that was the goal with, the, with those kits and our other kits too. So I can do a Nora another demonstration if anyone's interested. I think that'd be great. I also have a question. You know, I know you ship these out to anyone and everyone, what's been one of the more unexpected um, or surprising partnerships that have come from this? Um, the, the surprising thing to me is how many uh, businesses and corporations want to buy these kits for team building. Um, we've made created these for uh, churches during COVID, they wanted every single person of their, in their church to have one of these. And they all did them together during on Easter Sunday. Um, we do lots of team building. So um, we have companies that are based in New York or Colorado or wherever, and they have employees that are everywhere. They're always spread out. They're never together, probably even before COVID, they never were. And so they want to do these together. Um, and so that has been really a surprise at how many people and businesses are valuing the, the strength of art as far as like team building and mental health and all of that, you know. And when, when I approached um, the granting entities, you know, to ask for funding, I always bring up uh, that art is not a luxury. And I really don't think it's a luxury. I think it should be for everyone. And so it's helping me realize that that's true. You know, art is relaxing. Art isn't something that is only for certain people that can afford it. I think that even if it's just a few minutes a day or every now and then, it can really plant seeds of curiosity and of accomplishment and relaxation. And so, um, you know, I think that corporations and businesses are realizing that and that they're trying to use something besides seminars and other things. They're trying to bring these hands-on activities where they can create something and kind of use a different part of their brain, you know? So that's been one of the most fulfilling and unexpected surprises of, of this last year, just by offering these online and not just me sitting here calling people to say, you know, do you want, are you interested in this? But by putting it out on social media and by putting it on our website and on our Etsy shop, we're finding people that we could have never found before. And they're finding uses for it that we never thought about before. And so it's really good because it's helping us. Um, 
actually a lot of our small kits are because people said we need smaller versions for uh, the birthday parties. And we had to make smaller versions too because of COVID. Kids can't share kits. They can't share things like that anymore. So we started going mini on everything, mini marbling. So every child has their own and it's a way that we could afford to give them all their own. So it's interesting that COVID and these situations and how we're far away and we use electronics to talk to each other, it really does bring, I think, a lot of us closer. And by Zooming, we have a way of sharing art and things like that, you know, with each other. So, so that's one of my favorite stories. <laughs> That's great. There was a resounding yes, please, for another demonstration. Okay. It All is right, very Rachel started. helped me, and we have figured out how to get my computer screen to work. So, and if you guys want to unmute yourselves, you're welcome to. Otherwise, I will just chat away. Um, so what I've got here. How does that look? That looks great. Okay, I've got my my water. And I love these because you can use them as many over and over and over. I've got my two brushes here and I've got my paint. I'm gonna put my paint right here. Um, I wasn't really sure it's hard to balance the amount of paint with each kit with the amount of paper, but because, so we wanted everyone to have plenty of ink to do a lot more than the paper. I just want you to be able to use, you know, copy paper, even this craft paper that I'm using right here makes great um, marbling paper. Okay, so I, and you know, sometimes I just sit here and do this all day long. And I do have a video on YouTube called Mesmerizing Marbling. And it was just one of those days that I just wanted to relax and make art. So I just turned my camera on. So if any of you are wanting to see more techniques. Now, um, if your ink is sinking, if it sinks, it's because you're putting your brush in the water too deep. You just want to barely touch the top. And if you hold your brush on top of the water for longer, it'll make a bigger circle. Some colors expand different than others, which is very interesting. That's a little bit of fluid dynamics. It's because uh, different pigments have different weights. So you'll notice that some paints expand easier and farther than others. But I've only, you know, you don't have to dip your brush every time. You just dip it every now and then. So traditional Suminagashi was in these huge vats and they would, they would just drop their brushes in here thousands and thousands of times, which is really fun and relaxing. I don't know what it is about circles. They're just relaxing. So you could go on and on. I, I also love to just make one or two circles. All right, now I'm gonna print. The Japanese paper, you know, it kind of has a little bit of a different texture. There's a really smooth side and a little bit rougher. It doesn't really matter which side you use. Um, I like the smooth side, I don't know. I think I just think it might pick up easier. Um, so because you don't want an if you get an air bubble between the paper and your marbling, it'll just create, you won't have any paint there. So I like to start in the middle with a little bit of a curve, one, two, three, and I'm just gonna push it down. Rinse it a little bit. I'm gonna actually fill my water. I'm gonna fill this up a little bit more. And I love how they're all always different. You can never really predict. I'm going to get a little bit more water in mine real quick. It 
it just makes it easier to print when you don't have to when you your papers at the top. How's everyone? Does anyone have any questions right now? Um, I'm going to show you. I'm just going to keep painting for a while, and I hope that y'all are painting. But so my paint, I just poured it in. See, look, there's movement in my water. So if you don't want movement in your water, let your water sit a while. I kind of like that. It just adds that little bit of unexpected and it lets the water do your painting for you. There's no right or wrong way. And I think it's so fun to just see how everyone does it. I think that's an important part of this kit. Um, you, There is no right or wrong way. The only rules are don't dip your brush too deep and don't get too much paint. The rest you can just enjoy, especially with kids. They're so used to getting told what to do all the time and how to do everything. And I think art should be one of those things that we don't have to tell them how to do it all the time. And when we do have kids, sometimes I have one child at, at a time create a piece of art and everyone watches because this is the type of work that is so much about the experience that it's fun to watch what other people make. It's relaxing if you're, if you're making it or you're the one, uh, you know, watching, but it's fun to have the kids tap the table or blow and they can create their own work so they can watch it change. I think I might, I want to 